Hello, everyone, and welcome to our Speaker Spotlight series. We're honored today to have uh, Susan Buchanan as our guest speaker. She'll be speaking about endocrine disruptors in environmental health. Before we get started, a few things. Uh, all attendees have been muted, but we do welcome your questions and comments in the chat at any time. Miles, Region 6's Communications and Finance Coordinator, is providing technical assistance today, and he'll be keeping an eye on the chat with me. Please be sure to select everyone from the drop-down menu when posting your questions in chat to ensure both Miles and I see them. Uh, there will also be time for questions at the end. Closed caption has been enabled, and it's available by clicking on the icon with the three dots and then selecting closed caption. We're recording today's session and we'll post it to NNLM's YouTube channel in one to two weeks. You'll also receive a link to that recording. This class is eligible for both Medical Library Association uh, and CHES continuing education credit, which you'll be able to claim through the evaluation link and enrollment code that we share with you at the end of the session. And speaking of that evaluation, your feedback matters and helps us improve future training. So please take a moment to complete it after the webinar. This webinar is brought to you by the Network of the National Library of Medicine. A little bit about us. Um, the National Library of Medicine is one of the 27 institutes and offices of the National Institutes of Health. It's the world's largest biomedical library and produces online resources like PubMed and Medline Plus. NNLM, the Network of the National Library of Medicine, is an outreach program of NLM, working to ensure health professionals and the public have equal access to health information. NNLM is made up of seven regional medical libraries, three national offices, and four national centers, providing training, funding, and engagement opportunities to over 9,000 NNLM member organizations. Today's webinar was organized by Region 6 as part of our Speaker Spotlight series. You can connect with Region 6 uh, through social media or on our website. Our speaker today is Susan Buchanan, MD, MPH. Susan is the director of the Great Lakes Center for Children's and Reproductive uh, Environmental Health and a clinical associate professor of environmental and occupational health sciences at the University of Illinois Chicago School of Public Health. She is an expert in health problems related to toxic substances and other environmental hazards in the workplace and community. Her research interests include the health of minority, low-income, and immigrant workers, of children, and reproductive environmental health. She has published studies on the impact of fish consumption and mercury exposure in the Asian communities in Chicago, the use of protective gear among Latino day laborers, and lead exposure among Chicago's children. And with that, I'm going to hand it off. <clears throat> okay, great. Um, thanks everybody for having me. I'm really happy to be here. Susan Buchanan, I'm in Chicago, uh, working from home today. Um, and I'm going to tell you, uh, first of all, I'm gonna give you a little background about the funding for uh, the work that I do. So there's all kinds of logos there across the bottom. Um, the one that I wanna point out is the Pediatric Environmental Health Specialty Units. So <clears throat> I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about it at the end, but these are funded by EPA and ATSDR, the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry, terrible name, branch of the CDC. Um, and they have funded centers around the country um, focusing on health effects of environmental exposures to children and um, reproductive age women. They added uh, pregnancy uh, in the last 10 years. And these units, um, these centers are consist of healthcare providers. And our main mission is to reach out to other healthcare providers and teach them about children's environmental health and be resources to local agencies, public health departments, communities, parents, et cetera. So our center at the University of Illinois Chicago is called the Great Lakes Center for Children's Environmental Health. So that's the PESU for EPA Region 5. And I got the date wrong down there. It's 2023, not 2022. Sorry about that. Um, let me go down. So we do have some objectives. 
Um, I do want you to be able to list some, some major endocrine disruptors, not all of them. There's not going to be a test. Describe um, the physiologic and tox concepts of endocrine disruptors. Be able to advise patients, clients, or other learners in how to minimize exposure, in, including yourselves, um, to certain disruptors. So <clears throat> in occupational and environmental medicine, which I, I am board certified in this um, kind of niche specialty of OC environmental medicine, which is under general preventive medicine for our board certification, um, we learn a lot from, unfortunately, from disasters in the past um, when chemicals were kind of thrown out there into the public and then some unfortunate incidences occurred. So DES is the perfect example of how we first learn about endocrine disruption. And what you see on the left is this lovely little ad for, for DES to prevent abortion, miscarriage, and premature labor, recommended for routine prophylaxis in all pregnancies. So DES um, is a estrogenic substance. It um, is very strong mimicker of estrogen. And so what happened was giving women during pregnancy high doses of estrogen, yes, it, it did support pregnancy and prevent miscarriage, but you see um, on the timeline here, sorry, it's, it's a little small, but first produced in 1938, 1940s, widely prescribed, um, 1950s, four clinical trials found that it wasn't effective, but promotion continued. And then it wasn't until the 1970s that it was linked to vaginal carcinoma in DES daughters. So that is the female fetuses of the mothers who were taking DES grew up to, to have higher rates of vaginal cancer. And this is a slide showing um, some other birth defects associated with DES. So not just the clear cell adenocarcinoma of the vagina, very, very rare cancer um, seen mainly in DES daughters, but there were also these birth defects that you see on the left is basically just the different types of shapes, abnormal shapes of the uterus. Um, that um, resulted in DES daughters. So clearly as the uterus was forming um, in, the, in the fetal <clears throat> milieu and the mother was taking DES, it caused these um, horrific abnormalities. Um, also infertility in the daughters, preterm labor, uterine fibroids, and increased breast cancer. This is just a, a New England Journal graphic from way back, 1984, showing the breast cancer incidence differences between um, daughters, DES daughters exposed to DES in utero versus unexposed in the years since entry in the study. And you can just see how the exposed DES daughters have much higher rates of breast cancer. And then this was a really, really interesting study. Um, do I have the year 2011? So not that old. Prevalence of hypospadias in grandsons of women exposed to DES during pregnancy. And I have just a little picture there on the side of what hypospadias is. For those of you who don't know, it is when the urethra um, is a birth defect, when their urethra exits the penis, not at the tip, but somewhere else along the shaft or in the scrotum. Um, it is surgically um, repairable um, in most cases, but nevertheless, for DES, it was a very interesting indicator of epigenetic phenomena. So if you look at this graph, I'm going to um, point you on the right. So you've got first generation exposed pregnancies, and then those pregnancies um, that were females 28% of the females, so the daughters of the DE exposed mothers, had birth defects somewhere along the uterus or the vagina. And then those DES daughters that had sons had an 8.2% rate of hypospadias. So much higher <clears throat> than the non exposed. 
And you also had a higher rate of hypospadias in the sons that were exposed in utero. So not the grandsons, but the sons. So, and to me, 2011 is relatively recent. So we're, we're still seeing um, this intergenerational effect of this very high dose estrogen that was used. And then another really interesting case, this is from The Lancet, 1977. And it's just a screenshot of a page of a preliminary communication on the infertility in male pesticide workers. And it's really interesting to read these historic articles to see how they discovered some of these um, endocrine disruption effects. So this was dibromo chloropropane. DBCP, which is an amaticide, meaning it killed worms and parasites, was used widely in fruit, cotton, and um, nuts to prevent infestation. It had already been shown to cause sterility in rats. So you can dig up old studies from 40s, 50s, 60s, showing that DBCP was already known to cause um, sterility. Nevertheless, it continued to be used and there was one particular plant, particular plant in Northern California where workers mixed, diluted, and repackaged the pesticide. Um, and the men that worked there, just from talking to each other, noticed that they were having trouble conceiving. And the, an initial, so a, an astute doctor said, "Hmm, let's let's look into this," and had them supply um, semen analysis, put, uh, conducted semen analysis. And all five of them either had oligospermia or azospermia. So oligospermia is a low sperm count. Azospermia is no sperm whatsoever. So pretty dramatic finding there. And so the doctor expanded it to 25 workers and 11 of the 25 had low sperm counts. Nine out of the 11 had no, either no sperm. So azospermia, they underwent by biopsies and there were no sperm cells, uh, no germ cells. And so their recovery was poor. And then that, um, that chemical was then banned in 1977. It was not banned in Hawaii until 1987, mainly because of its usefulness in pineapples. And I just included some pictures here that show you um, these differences of uh, a typical sperm count, you just put in a semen analysis, you just put a sample under a microscope and start count, counting how many you see per high power field. And this is an example of a low sperm count and including some abnormalities in sperm that are also described in a semen analysis that they did see in that study. So when they, when they finally expanded it to 107 exposed workers, they found 13% had no sperm, 70% severe, low sperm count, 16% mild, and then motility and morphology affected even eight years after exposure. And that's what you see here is some of the morphology, meaning the shape of the sperm are abnormal. You can see some of double, double tails, the heads are abnormal, here's a double head. So morphology was affected <clears throat> up to eight years. There was one more pesticide study also, and this was um, summarized in a 2007 study where ethylene dibromide was used in 1987, 46 men, in a papaya fumigation industry in Hawaii. And they were found to also have decreased sperm count and uh, low proportions of viable and modal spermatozoa. So they didn't swim, they didn't swim very well. And in 1974, Kipone, 57% of 133 workers, exposed workers in a plant had low sperm counts. So when we talk about um, reproductive environmental health effects, we often just think of the woman and her infertility or problems with the fetus or problems in pregnancy. But the sperm are, are also very sensitive to endocrine disruption as these studies show. And there are really interesting, I mean, it's a whole field that I think often doesn't get enough attention in environmental health of the effect on um, sperm and semen uh, uh, health. 
So that was just kind of a historic introduction, but let's let's talk about what, what does it mean to be an endocrine disrupting chemical? What do we mean? So in 1997, EPA wrote this very long definition, an exogenous agent that interferes with the synthesis secretion, blah, 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 of natural bloodborne hormones, or in simpler terms, a substance which interferes with natural hormones. So that's what we mean by endocrine disruption. And um, I know maybe not everybody on here is a healthcare provider uh, or has health training. So I just included here a graphic of what we mean by the endocrine system. And so these are the typical organs in the body that produce or manage hormones. So any of these can be affected by hormone disruption. And you notice the ovaries down there produce estrogen and the testes produce testosterone. The adrenal gland also produces um, sex hormones. Pancreas makes insulin, which is a hormone. Thyroid makes, of course, thyroid hormone. And the pituitary and the pineal gland make hormones that, that run everything. They make the feedback hormones. And this is how, um, this is how endocrine disrupting chemicals can act. And just focus on this graphic on the right. It is a depiction of a cell and that gray line on the outside is the cell wall. And that broken up double gray line is the nucleus. And a steroid hormone is what we're talking about, hormone, let's say it's insulin or estrogen. It um, enters the cell and then a receptor pro protein takes it into the nucleus where it, um, it, communicates with the DNA, which then makes the messenger RNA that says make new protein that then goes out into the body. So for example, thyroid stimulating hormone. So that's given off by the um, hypopituitary gland that then tells the thyroid gland, you need to make more thyroid hormone. So TSH goes down to the thyroid and says make more thyroid hormone because this feedback says there's not enough. So the nucleus, so it goes into the nucleus, nucleus, you know, the DNA says make more thyroid hormone. But when you have a endocrine disrupting chemical, the cell, instead of um, <clears throat> the steroid hormone entering the cell and linking onto that receptor protein, something else that is acting like thyroid hormone, TSH, gets into the nucleus and gives the wrong message. So you can get imbalanced. You can have low thyroid and you got a chemical telling your thyroid not to make more thyroid hormone, but to make either the same or less or make something else. So it can really um, disrupt these very intricate and delicate feedback mechanisms. And, it, and endocrine disrupting chemicals have been shown to interfere with estrogen receptor pathways, anti-androgen activity, progesterone blockage, thyroid hormone in, in, uh, interference. And I would add insulin as well. Now, there are now um, endocrine disrupting chemicals that are called obesogens that do some plasticizers have been found to promote obesity in uh, at least at the um, animal research level. So now we've defined you know, what we're talking about with endocrine disruption. And I want to approach the problem um, the way we do in environmental medicine, which is somebody comes in and says, I think I'm exposed to X. Is it causing my health effect Y? And you can do this for a whole community. A community is exposed to some pollutant, let's say vinyl chloride from a train derailment. Um, is it causing the health effect that a community might be experiencing? And there are different steps that you have to go through as a expert in this area to determine whether um, this is actually the case. So the first step is you look at the epidemiology, other health trends in the general population. And then you do an exposure assessment. Are, are people actually being exposed to the chemical? So for example, we'll get a patient that, I had a patient that said, you know, I have, it was something like a well that they didn't use way in their backyard that had some chemical in it that they were concerned about. And the issue with us was, well, how do we know whether they're actually exposed to what's weighed in the corner of their backyard? 
And then say, once you prove that, oh yes, they are being exposed, you then need to look at the chemical. What do we know? Do we know that, chemi that this chemical causes health out outcomes? Let's look in the literature and see what we know. And then the last step is really putting it all together and saying, is there enough evidence to conclude that X causes Y? <clears throat> and so that's the way I'm going. we have approached endocrine disruption and the way I've organized this lecture. So the first step, are there adverse health trends in the general population that would make us worry that maybe the endocrine system is being disrupted on a population level? And we look at prevalence, we look at demographics, and this is a beautiful study by Tracy Woodruff back in 2010, where the, her team gathered tons and tons of studies and data and put together this chart, which really uh, beautifully depicts the trends that they found. And on the top, you see the arrow going up, and these are abnormalities in the endocrine system that are increasing. And you see testicular cancers going up, certain childhood cancers, autism, ADHD, and these birth defects of cryptorchidism, which is undescended testes, and congenital hypothyroidism, so babies that are born with um, not enough thyroid hormone. And then on the bottom half is reproductive function. The arrow down means decreased function of the reproductive system. You see difficulty conceiving and maintaining pregnancy, even in uh, women less than 25 years old, 200% increase. Prematurity of birth, preeclampsia going up, gestational diabetes. Um, premature puberty. You see age at onset of breast development, one to two years younger, and age at onset of menstruation, just a few months younger, but still statistically significant. And then look at that sperm count and serum testosterone, 1% decline per year. And serum testosterone, 1%. So we've seen a really dramatic decrease in testicular function since the beginning of the industrial age. So... Um, a few more slides on trends. Here's I spoke about hypospadias um, in relation to DES, and here's a summary of studies from. And this is this is not even 1999. They put together various studies showing the increased incidence of hypospadias, and you can see how it's pretty dramatic in uh, some of these studies from Atlanta. And here's a, a researcher that put together trends in sperm count. And I put a picture of Shana Swan there in her book that she published uh, during the pandemic called Countdown. Um, she's, this, she's an amazing researcher and um, wrote this lay publication, this book about how the sperm count has gone down so dramatically since the beginning of the industrial age. And she goes into what chemicals have been found. And she actually did the studies of newborns measuring levels of plasticizers and effect on the genital formation of newborns. And so she see, you can see the two different graphs here of the time between 1970 and 2010 of um, decline in sperm concentration on the left and actual count on the right. So if you're really interested in this, um, I recommend um, her book because it is written for the lay public. You can get it on Amazon. And I'm not getting paid <laughs> to promote her book. Cryptorchidism, this is just another similar graph from 1999 showing the increase of undescended testes. This is also uh, the descent of the testes into the scrotum is um, responsive to testosterone in the fetus. All right, so I showed you some trends. So we see trends in the general population. That does not mean just because it all started in the industrial age does not mean that it's the chemicals put out by that industry that caused it. We gotta go through these steps. <clears throat> so sex step two is exposure assessment. So are we being exposed? So, okay, we see these trends, but what, what are we exposed to as humans? And in fact, there are some really amazing studies that show, and another one by Tracy Woodruff at UCSF, she took um, a bunch of pregnant women and every column here is a different pregnant woman and each color is the chemical that was found in her blood. So she's pregnant and every single one in this study had phthalates, which is a plasticizer, is the purple. Green is polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. So that's from burning fossil fuels. PBDEs are stain guards, 
found all over our homes and in personal care products. Um, and that's in the orange. And in the light blue is organochlorine pesticides. Gray is metals. So that would be lead, mercury, arsenic. And then cotinine is the only one that wasn't found in every single woman. And cotinine is a metabolite of tobacco smoke. So we're doing some kind of improvement since it wasn't in every single woman, but a lot of them did have it. But nevertheless, this is a really nice depiction showing that, yep, uh, pregnant women have all this stuff in them. And we think about the fetus, okay, well, maybe the placenta protects the fetus in the pregnant woman. So pregnant woman's got it in her body, but how do we know that goes to the fetus? Well, there are really interesting studies. It's very easy to check the blood of the fetus because you take it from the umbilical cord when the placenta is hasn't detached yet. So as soon as the baby's born, the umbilical cord gets cut and then you put in the still pulsing because it's still attached to the mother and you unclamp it and, and, and drip it into a tube. And what you that, that gives you exactly what was in the fetus. And this study showed the levels of um, flame retardants, perfluorochemicals or flame retardants and stain, stain guards in mother baby pairs. So every pair of column, the black is the level in the mother and the blue is the level in the fetus. So you can see that it's not only present in every mother baby pair, but that it's a higher concentration in the fetus. So what we've learned over the years is the placenta is not protecting the fetus from exposure to what's in the mother's blood. And it's sometimes it even concentrates. And this is the case for mercury too, methylmercury in fish, concentrates in the fetus. So bad news. This was an interesting study of personal care products. And when we say personal care products, PCPs, we're talking about cosmetics, fragrances, soaps, deodorants, shampoo, nail polish, shaving cream, all kinds of all the stuff that we use on our bodies. And they did a survey found that the average adult woman uses 12 PCPs per day. Teenage girls use up to 17. And two of the main ones, sorry, I didn't put a reference on this. It's on the next slide, but the two main ones are phthalates. So there's diethyl phthalate that carries scent. So there's a whole class of phthalates that carry scent in personal care products. And then there's a whole class that's a plasticizer. So it makes um, not only um, other products um, flexible, but it's used in like nail polish to get that nice surface. It makes personal care products viscous. And um, oh, where's it? Oh, shoot, I took out the slide. I'm sorry. There was a really interesting study of um, teenage girls in California that um, is a replacement study where they measured the levels in their urine of these plasticizers at the beginning, and then they gave them non-phthalate containing personal care products and measured their urine again and showed pretty dramatic differences in the levels in the urine when they were using their regular personal care products versus when they were using personal care products um, that were non, that had no phthalates. This was also a <clears throat> exposure study published in 2015. So not real new, but it looked at NHANES 2003 to 2010. I imagine that you all know what NHANES is, the National Health and Nutrition Examination Study performed every year in the US on a re representative population, measuring various things in the blood and urine of this representative population. And for these seven years, they summarized the levels of benzophenone, which is in lots of personal care products, including sunscreens. 97% of the people had that in them. Triclosan is an antimicrobial that's in that was in toothpaste. I think it's out of toothpaste, but in other products that are antimicrobial. The parabens are also in a lot of makeups and sunscreens, present over 90% of the population. And that list down there are phthalates, diethyl phthalate, uh, di, actually I can't remember what those stand for, in over 96% of urine samples. So these three slides lead me to believe we are all exposed to all this stuff. We've all got it in us. So the case has been made that we have these um, potentially endocrine disrupting substances in us. So the next step is, okay, so we have it in us. So what? Is it causing a health effect? What do we know? 
about um, the health effects. And this area of research is absolutely exploding. So there are dozens, dozens, hundreds of, of studies published on a regular basis in um, our main journals, our environmental health perspectives out of the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences, NIEHS puts out environmental health perspectives. Environmental research is a big one. And then there are several other environmental health and public health, environmental health and occupational health um, um, pro, um, journals that um, are, like I said, exploding in the number of studies <clears throat> that are looking into the toxicity. We got the exposure, are the health effects happening? There are animal studies, there are epi studies that look at statistical association, and then there are epi studies that look at dose response, which is also really important. If the dose increases, does the health effect get worse? And um, I'm just going to show you a couple examples, but this is a really busy slide, unfortunately. But um, it, it was just an example of looking at prenatal urinary concentrations of phthalates. I told you that was a plasticizer that makes plastics flexible, but also carries scent. Some types carry scent and bisphenol A. So BPA makes plastics rigid and used to be in plastic bottles, including baby, baby bottles and like Nalgene water bottles has now been taken out. And it looked at the timing of puberty in boys and girls. And this is the table for girls. And if you look over on the left is the list of biomarkers of um, thalarchy is when um, is breast development. And that list of MBCP, MCNP, blah, 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 are the different types of phthalate and bisphenol A that they measured. And then that next subcategory is puberty. So when pubic hair appears and menarche is when menstruation starts in girls. And in the red boxes are the statistically significant associations. That little one shows an association between BPA levels so this is urinary concentration of prenatal BPA and when normal weight girls developed pubic hair, okay? And then under that is onset of menstruation with these various types of BPA and showed statistical significance in normal weight girls. Mm -hmm. So this is just an example of a study where an association was found. And I'm not going to go through a bunch of other you know, studies, um, except to show this one, because it's an example of a study this is from 2008, endocrine disrupting pesticides, implication for risk assessment. So this is only pesticides. And I showed you, I'm showing you here a screenshot of the table that shows studies that show health effects from these different pesticides. And this table is only the A's through the C's. So in this journal article, it's pretty amazing. The table goes, there are just hundreds of pesticides out there. Um, it goes through A through Z, through all the pesticides and summarizes all the literature showing health effects from exposure. And the conclusion is there in quotes, a large body of evidence has accumulated linking specific conditions to endocrine disrupting pesticides in wildlife and humans. So instead of showing you a bunch of individual studies, I thought I would show you <clears throat> just this amazing summary uh, just of pesticides and the, the evidence showing health effects, endocrine disruption health effects. Okay, so we've gone through steps one, two, and three. We looked at trends of uh, abnormalities in the general population in reproductive and other endocrine diseases. We've looked at, um, are these chemicals in the body? And I show you some examples of the blood and urine in moms and babies. We looked at, okay, well, it's in the body. Has it been shown to be linked to health effects? And I really only showed you a very few um, of those, just uh, trusting me that there are dozens and dozens of other studies on all kinds of chemicals out there. So now we, put, now we put this all together. Is there enough evidence to conclude that X exposure causes Y health outcome? 
And in general, uh, what I'm talking about is evidence to include that exposure to endocrine disrupting chemicals is causing ad adverse health effects on humans. So, well, let's see what the experts say. Back in 2008, so that's now 15 years ago, the Endocrine, Deci the Endocrine Society came out with their first scientific statement. This was a big deal. And they also had a very, it's a really long article. You see there, it's like nine pages long and then all kinds of data. And they summarized that the evidence for adverse reproductive outcomes, including infertility, cancers, malformations, from exposure to endocrine disrupting chemicals is strong. And there is mounting evidence for effects on other systems, including thyroid, neuroendocrine, obesity, and metabolism, insulin, and glucose. So that was 2008. And then in 2015, they came back for a second time and said, we've reviewed 1,300 articles published after that first scientific statement, which was back in 2008. They reviewed 1,300 more articles. Both statements together establish a strong basis for concern about health effects associated with EDCs and now provide mechanistic understanding. So how is it that they're doing this? at low doses, particularly during development and at low doses. And new studies in humans have established associations between EDC exposures and numerous chronic diseases. So they, um, and this is the list they gave about scientific knowledge since 2009 it identifies this increased incidence of impaired reproduction, neurodevelopment alterations, not, what they mean by that is on behavior issues with kids, with their, when they're trying to neurodevelopment intelligence, um, impulse control, emotional outbursts, that type of thing, autism, thyroid dysfunction, obesity, autoimmune disease, diabetes, and increased susceptibility for hormone sensitive cancers, like some breast cancers, of course. So these were two pretty, pretty bold statements. And then our own NIH and the NIHS has an endocrine disruptors program. And this is the list that they are saying, let me see when I have, oh, I can't see the year because my little Zoom bar is up, but I wanted to see um, if there's a year associated with this of their list of what is the, what the NIEHS considers to be endocrine disruptors. So we've got dioxins, which are um, byproducts of burning um, like incineration, organophosphates, organochlorines, these are pesticides. I showed you that slide of pesticide, that, that data collection. Um, PCBs, I heard you um, understand you did receive a lecture with PCBs, not made anymore, but are persistent in the environment. So there are still exposures. DDT was banned in 1972, still found in the environment today. Phthalates, I didn't mention those plasticizers. Tributyl tin and tin compounds from fungicides. And separately, air pollution, heavy metals, and solvents. So a pretty long list of endocrine disruptors so far recognized by NIEHS. So <clears throat> sometimes when I go through this talk, people get really anxious and upset about everything we're exposed to, and it's not really fair to just leave people hanging. So let's go through some personal interventions to decrease exposure. And I say personal interventions with the caveat that I believe the government should be protecting us from these chemicals, that it shouldn't be left up to the individual to decrease their exposures. So, of course, there is the angle of advocacy toward our local, state, and federal governments um, to use their legislative power to make sure that we're not exposed to these chemicals in the first place. Imagine that. But these are some things that you can do. The Environmental Working Group puts out a shopper's guide to pesticides and produce. They update it every year. You know, I think this list, yeah, this was from 2020. Um, so you need to go to the Environmental Working Group website yourself and find out what this year's Dirty Dozen and Clean 15 are. So that if you can afford or want to buy organic produce, you can focus on avoiding the Dirty Dozen and making sure that you don't have to buy organic of the clean 15. So for 2020, avocados, corn, pineapple, onions, papaya, et cetera, et cetera, those were okay, it didn't need to be organic. 
But the dirty dozen, these are the ones with the highest levels of pesticides in 2020 were strawberries, spinach, kale, et cetera. So if you wanted to splurge on your organic, you might want to focus on those. The Environmental Working Group also has this really cool database called Skin Deep. It is a personal care product database so that you can find out what is in the personal care products you use. And I took a screen, screenshot here um, because I just put in the word shampoo to see what came up and I got 4,548 products. So a very, very extensive collection of personal care products. You can click on, you know, you can search on exactly what you use to see what's in it. And you can find lists of, you know, shampoos or whatever personal care product that um, is considered to be, you know, without endocrine disrupting chemicals. So Skin Deep is awesome. And I have a few examples from our website at our center in Chicago. We have um, these graphics on our website that show steps to reduce exposures in the home. And it goes through the different rooms of your home and has icons with the different exposures, what they are and what you can do um, to help avoid them. So um, this one talks about furniture, you know, changing furniture and mattress <clears throat> um, so that you're not exposed to the flame retardants. And um, let me see if I have another one. No, I don't have another example, but it goes through the different rooms of the home. And then we also have on our website available for downloading a guide we put together for communities. And this is for community members who want to know what's in their neighborhood. And it's a collection of all the public databases. There are tons and tons of online public databases that can tell you exactly what is in your neighborhood per zip code. And we go through air pollution, water pollution, soil, um, soil contamination. And there is a, this one on the right is a quick guide that shows you all, everything that's available online for multiple pollutants. Um, like the toxic release inventory, the EJ screen. It's a mapping tool for environmental justice communities. And we also have an advocacy section of how you can identify the leaders in your community to advocate for um, cleaner air, water, and soil. And then my last few slides are just telling you about our PESU that is available to you. Um, for any types of questions that you might have, that your healthcare providers might have about exposures to children or during pregnancy. This map shows you the different EPA regions covered by the different paces. So we're region five, we're in the pink region. Mm -hmm. um, you in, uh, if you're, I know our hosts are from Iowa, uh, Kansas City is where the piece, the PESU is for region seven. And as I mentioned, funded by EPA and ATSDR, the branch of the CDC that deals with community level exposures and staffed by healthcare providers. We got access to medical toxicologists, industrial hygienists, and now we've added OBGYNs and nurse midwives so that we can cover reproductive and environmental health as well. Every center has a hotline, so a phone number where you can reach us and an email address. And that is ours for here in Chicago and region five. But whatever region you're in, you can go to PESU.net and contact the PESU for your region if you have questions. We are funded to provide clinical consultations, so like telephone consults to healthcare providers and families. Um, most of the PESUs do have a connection to a clinic if we have to see pe people in person, <clears throat> but that's off it's often preferable to deal with the healthcare provider of the exposed patient instead of having them travel to our clinic. We provide expertise to public health agencies and environmental agencies. We train, we do trainings like this with physicians, nurses, other healthcare professionals. We do communities, workers, all kinds of groups. And this is uh, just a screenshot of our um, website in Chicago. This is our region five team. And I will say before you get excited that we have the swimming level is extremely small and everybody on this in this picture has a teeny bit of FTE dedicated to this purpose. So if anyone asks you if we need more money, say yes. 
Anyway, nevertheless, we have a bunch of people in the Chicago area, including our reproductive health care providers, our medical toxicologist. We've got um, folks identified in each of the states who are willing to be our liaison for that state. And then Dr. Nick Newman in Cincinnati is also board certified in occupational medicine and pediatrics, one of the only in the country, only people in the country with dual board certification in those two specialties. And he has a kids clinic, uh, lead clinic and environmental exposures clinic in Cincinnati. Okay, I left some time for questions. I see there are some questions in the chat and the Q&A. Here's our phone number, our website and our email address for region five, but I do encourage you to go to paysu.net if you are in a different region and wanna know where your PACE is located and what the contact info is. All right, thank you. Let's go to questions. Okay, questions. Um, looks like someone asked, was DES used pretty much across the board in pregnancies before the original study was released showing the significant birth defects? Was it used across the board? In pregnant. Meaning like every single woman? No, I don't think every single woman was given it. Um, no, I don't think you can make that assumption. I think it was probably reserved, despite the ad saying that all women should get it, I think it was reserved for women that perhaps had a previous miscarriage, for example, or a previous preterm birth. And then another question is with situations like autism, couldn't that 700 to 800% increase be uh, part and due to better screening? Yes, it is in part due to better screening, but it is not all explained by better screening. I mean, that has been accounted for, not in that increase. Um, in that increase would include better screening, but in studies that are looking um, more carefully and with biostatistical methods at, at the actual increase, they do um, control um, for the increased diagnostic. Uh, clearly, we're diagnosing more kids with it. Everybody my age knows the kids that had autism and everyone just thought they were abnormal, right? They didn't carry that diagnosis. But even taking that into consideration, uh, it's an increased incidence for sure. And then another question is, in terms of pregnant women, if we are actively avoiding chemicals, I'm assuming that doesn't necessarily decrease it enough to make a difference due to environmental exposures? <clears throat> um, that's a great question. Um, you know, the studies that we have seen, the intervention studies, at this point often ha have only looked at um, the exposure, the, the levels, the exposure decrease. For example, they had families go on an organic diet. They measured, well, they measured pesticide levels in their urine, and then they put them on an organic diet for two weeks, fed them, you know, in the study. They only ate the food that was given to them in the study, and they did the urine levels. Again, and they showed a decrease. So you can rest assured that your levels will go down with some of these interventions. What we don't know if it's, that's enough to decrease the health effects because, yeah, you're getting plasticizers just by breathing in the fumes from your new computer, most likely, or flame retardants and plasticizers. So, um, yes, it's... I agree that that is lacking, and that's why I prefer to, to focus on um, advocacy at the federal level to decrease the chemicals in our environment in general so that we don't have to be the ones trying to decrease our individual exposures. And then we have another question. Are these disruptors also related to microbiome issues? You know, not that I know of. The microbiome issues are microbials. So they're, you know, the single-celled organisms. And that's, we're talking about pure carbon-based chemical exposures. Okay, let's go over to the chat and see what questions are there. Um, Someone says, is there any truth to the idea that the chemicals allowed in organic farming are also harmful? No. So, I mean, organic farming just, it only refers to the pesticides. So it means that they don't, you know, they only use um, non-chemical pesticides. I mean, they, they might use 
like boric acid or something, but but they're the types of pesticides that are not related to health effects. It doesn't mean it's necessarily, what is, some people make assumptions about what organic means, about whether it's healthier or the amount of vitamins and minerals or whatever. It it's only pertains to the pesticides. But yes, you, you, can, you should rest assured that if they're grown organically, it's not going to have pesticides on it. Now, when it gets to the warehouse and packaging, does it get some of some chemicals in it from the packaging? I suppose that's possible. I, I actually don't know a whole lot about that. Somebody says, what about EDs in our food? I'm thinking of soy. I feel like I don't hear much about it these days, even though my own dog warned me against eating too much soy. DCIS diagnosis, estrogen receptor positive. Yeah, I there is some evidence. Now, soy being a food-based um, chemical, it's not really my area of expertise. I think my I'm more comfortable talking about industrially produced chemicals um, and not soy from, you know, soybean production, but uh, there definitely is evidence that it does work as an estrogenic substance. Yeah. Um, let's see what other questions we have. In what other countries was DES used? <sighs> I'm sorry. I can't tell you. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, let's see. I've got one here. What would be the beginning adverse effects that you would see before the decrease, increase in hormone effects? Um, I'd have to say there wouldn't be any. That's the that's the problem that these <clears throat> abnormalities can affect can occur at really low dose of exposure. We used to think that it takes higher exposures to cause more health effects, but with endocrine disruption, we see it with very small doses, and there aren't really any effects until you you know have a have a thyroid. Um, overt thyroid issue. With mercury, one of the things I've been involved with is, with exposure to methylmercury through fish consumption is whether pregnant women should get hair mercury levels or blood mercury levels based on how much fish they eat. Because since there are no symptoms, should we be doing more measuring of levels um, just across the board so that we can inform people that you know they may develop health effects based on their levels? But that's not something that's routinely done. The only thing we do in that nature is we draw blood blood levels on kids. No, there's really no um, overt symptoms at low levels, but we just screen all kids who live in old homes to make sure that their levels are um, not too high. Someone says PFAS uh, have been in the news in the last few years. Anything to say or share about those? Yes, um, PFAS chemicals are exploding in popularity for, I mean, in, in awareness, which is fantastic. So many places that are being uh, checked, the drinking water sources are being checked for PFAS. They are finding PFAS chemicals. These are, there are like 12,000 different types of perfluorochemicals, many used as flame retardants. They're used in firefighting foams, which is often how they end up contaminating our drinking water because airports and military facilities and firefighter training facilities use these foams um, in their training. So, and then it just runs off into the ground and then gets in the drinking water. So they're finding it in a lot of places. The National Academies of Science, <clears throat> Engineering and Medicine published guidelines in the summer it was, it's pretty amazing recommending, well, the, the part that I paid the most attention to was recommending that healthcare providers draw levels of PFAS in people who are known to be exposed. And I've been trying to figure out how to do that since it came out in the summer, because there are very few labs that do it. And the, and the samples are like $600 a piece. And I don't know if insurance is going to cover. So we actually haven't started doing that. Um, but the NASM report also put together all the evidence and listed the um, effects that are known effects and then some suspected effects. And dis endocrine disruption is definitely on that list, including testicular cancer and breast cancer, I think. Okay. Miles, do you see any more questions? Um. Oh, one just came into the Q&A. 
Okay. URL for website seems to go to red site. Oh, that's not good. I was starting to wonder if there's hope for us. There are so many more people with a lot of the mentioned health issues. Has it been related to skin conditions? It sound like more have skin related problem nowadays, even those without makeup. Um, we are noticing, well, what I would say is skin conditions is that those are related to allergies and we are seeing more allergies. Um, some of that, there are a couple different reasons. The respiratory allergies are linked to climate change because you get more um, allergy pollen, high pollen days with the heat. But also a uh, couple things, our immune systems are affected by some of this endocrine disruption and chemicals have been shown. And that's one thing that PFAS has been shown is a decrease in immune response to vaccines. So our immune systems um, in some cases are not working as well. And there's more um, auto antibodies causing diseases that are when your immune system attacks yourself, attacks itself. And some of that results in skin conditions. Um, you know, eczemas and rashes um, can certainly be a result of, um, of those types of exposures or a result of your immune system having an allergy. And, um, you know, I, I am I'm concerned that our website doesn't work, but what I would say is just Google um, Children's Environmental Health, University of Illinois or something, and you should get it. Sorry about that. Oh, we have one more question. Uh, and then, then that probably be about as much as we have time for. Minneapolis is planning to demolish a warehouse that built, built roofing material and building a parking lot for trucks. The surrounding neighborhoods are advocating for the opportunity to buy the space. Thoughts? Um, go for it. No, um, and the first thing that pops into my mind is environmental justice. And it seems like these types of incidents occur more often in communities that are disempowered and have been disinvested. And when they have, when they very rarely happen in communities that are full of lawyers, you know, attorneys and doctors, and people that know how to advocate and write letters to the editor and call their legislators and, and rattle chains. So I would, uh, <clears throat> if it's an EJ community, I hope they can link up with a Minneapolis environmental justice group that can help them. There are also demands that can be made if the warehouse demolition is going to occur. There are demands that can be made to require monitoring around the perimeter and the local health department or the state EPA can become involved with performing that monitoring. They can also require that the demolition be um, performed in a certain way that will minimize dust by, by wetting down during demolition. And that's about the limit of my knowledge about that. But certainly the community um, can make those types of demands. It's possible. And if they buy the land, they may incur, they may end up having huge environmental remediation um, costs. So sometimes building a parking lot is the cheapest thing to do instead of trying to build a park, for example, because with the parking lot, there would be less environmental mediation, remediation required because children aren't going to be exposed to it. So um, unfortunately, I think that is all the questions we have time for right now. Um, I do want to get the, uh, I do want to get the, um, the evaluate, evaluation link to everybody. So I'm going to share my screen and just mention that um, if you enjoyed this webinar, um, think about joining the network. Um, network membership is for organizations, not individuals, and uh, that can make you eligible for funding from us, um, as well as a number of other benefits. You can also sign up for one of our many newsletters um, by going to our newsletter site, and you can find out about more free webinars and classes. I wanted to give a big thank you to Dr. Buchanan for speaking with us today. We are very lucky that you agreed to, to join us. And thank you to everyone in the audience, too. Um, here is the evaluation link, um, as well as a code to get your continuing education credit. Uh, there is also a link to that that Miles has put in the chat. Thank you very much for having me. Thanks for watching. This video was produced by the Network of the National Library of Medicine. 
Select the circular channel icon to subscribe to our channel, or select a video thumbnail to watch another video from the channel.